you taking the time to join us. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. It's also being broadcast on Facebook Live. So if you have anybody who you think might be interested in joining last second, we encourage you to have them join us uh, either by sending them the link or by directing them to Facebook. So one thing for those of you who have joined us before, you'll know that we really appreciate your feedback. We do take it very seriously and we try to integrate that into our future webinars. It's important to us that you're engaged with the content, that it makes sense to you, it's presented in a way that you can follow. So we are going to send you an email after this webinar with a survey. We ask you to take a few moments, fill it out. If you do fill it out, we'll be sending you a, a walk along a pen as an, a token of our gratitude uh, for taking that time. The email will also contain a link to this uh, webinar. So if you have to hop out uh, at any point, you could catch up by just clicking on the link and watching it at a future date. And we'll also provide to you some links to some of our future webinars, including our next one, which is on employment law. And that is slated for the new year on January 21st. And uh, Tanya and Jordan Koenig will be speaking to uh, for that webinar. And one more note, uh, we'll also be providing to you a link to Tanya's recent webinar that she hosted in conjunction with Sotheby's Realty. Uh, the reason we're gonna circulate that is it contains some recent legislative updates. For those of you who joined us in the past, you'll know that legislative updates is usually a standard part of our webinars, uh, but we had a lot of questions. We want to get to those. If you do have interest in some of the legislative updates, we encourage you to click the link to the Sotheby's webinar and just catch up that way. So our agenda for today. Uh, basically, it's gonna be a quick shot through the introduction to the panelists, who the speakers are. We're gonna explain to you our objectives for the day and then go over some housekeeping. The bulk of the time is gonna be spent on the substantive portion. So you can see there just a succinct list of uh, the topics that we're going to be covering today. And then we are going to get into an open uh, Q&A period at the end in the last 10 minutes. And before we dive in, we just want to state that this webinar is for general informational purposes only and is not intended to be legal advice. Our panelists for the day. So on the left is the image of Tanya Walker. Tanya is a trial lawyer that graduated from McMaster University in 2002 with an honors degree in commerce. And then she attended Osgoode Hall Law School. She graduated in 2005 and became a licensed lawyer in 2006 and she practiced uh, at two Bay Street firms before opening Walker Law, which has now been open for 10 years. And for those of you who follow us on Instagram, you would have seen the lovely cake that Tanya bought. It was really good. Uh, encourage you to follow us on Instagram as well if you wanna see some of those photos. And Tanya regularly appears as a legal analyst on CTV, CBC, and CP24. Rishi Nagashar on your right is also a lawyer with our firm. He articled with us and then he joined us in uh, this year. Uh, articling, for those of you who aren't familiar, can be thought of as a, an apprenticeship. And then lastly, uh, I am Jordan Routliff. I am your host for today. My practice focuses primarily on property law, but I've done a wide range of commercial contract disputes as well. And we want to give a very special thank you to Marley Annette. She's a paralegal with our team. And she basically stitched together everybody's ideas and put them into these slides the way you see them now, very nice and organized. She put a lot of time and energy into it. So we wanna give a special thank you to Marley for helping us get this off the ground. Our objectives for today. So we have two simple objectives. Uh, basically the first is to help you understand your contract law, uh, common contract law issues. And then the second, arguably the more important one is to give you tips on how to avoid litigation in the future with respect to those issues. The housekeeping. So the first of our housekeeping slides just gives you a sense of some of the functionality on Zoom. One of the things that we've received in our previous feedback was that some people enjoy having the speaker and the slide content in equal proportions or one larger than the other. The way you can do that is by going to the top of your Zoom window, you'll see a drop down menu that says view options. And if you go to the bottom of that, you'll see a side-by-side -side option. You just click that. Then you, your slide deck and the panelists will be side-by-side. -side. There's a bar in the middle. And if you just click that and drag it to the left or the right, you can enlarge whichever image you prefer. 
the polls. So we really enjoy making the webinars as interactive as possible. For those of you who have joined us in the past, you'll know this is kind of a staple of our, our webinars. And so you will see polls pop up throughout the webinar today. You select what you believe is the right answer and you submit the poll and we discuss the results. It just gives us a sense of you know, what your perspectives are and how you might be thinking. And for those of you who are joining us through a mobile device, when it comes to these polls, we would encourage you if possible to transfer to a laptop or a desktop just because the functionality is a little bit different on a mobile phone. So if you can, please switch your devices. Answering your questions. So in, in line with the uh, interactivity component, we like to answer your questions throughout the presentation to the best that we can, uh, to the best of our ability. So the way that we like to do that is to have you submit your questions through the Q&A function that's located at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can see the icon there. You click that, type in your question. We'll either type an answer back to you or we'll indicate that we're gonna answer it live. And if that's the case, then one of us will speak to that point. Um, for those of you who sent your questions in advance, we thank you. In order to keep the uh, registrants confidential, the ones who sent us questions in advance, we'll only be referring to those individuals by their initials. So nobody's gonna be put on the spot. We can have an open discussion about these questions. The roadmap. So you'll see that we follow a con consistent format as we go through the substantive portion. Step one is we put a scenario to you, a question to you, and then we ask you to answer the poll. So the poll just helps us understand your perspective. Step two, we're gonna go to the, what we believe is the most correct answer and discuss the law where appropriate, uh, just so you can see what our perspective is, how we would view that issue. The third is how to protect yourself. So we're gonna give you some solutions going forward, what you might wanna think about, you know, in terms of drafting your contracts, negotiating your contracts. And then lastly, we're gonna have a, a pause where we're gonna answer some of those questions that were provided to us in advance and time permitting some of the additional questions that we get throughout the webinar today. And that brings us to our first poll. So we ask you, what contract law issue concerns you the most? So the first is obtaining judgment against someone. The second is suing someone in another jurisdiction. The third is protecting against force majeure. The fourth is when a contractual condition is waived or ignored. And the fifth is misrepresentations in a contract. And for those of you who none of these apply to you, please click other and let us know what your thoughts are in the Q&A. Please vote. All right, so we have an interesting split. Um, basically, it looks like uh, misrepresentation has taken the lion's share of the votes today, so we'll try and give that some extra care uh, with obtaining judgment as the runner up. And that brings us to our substantive portion, and with that, I will turn it over to Tanya Walker. Thank you, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So I will be speaking to you a little bit about what to do when you want to object, obtain judgment against someone. Now, before I go into the poll question, I just want to explain to you the difference between an action versus an application because that deals with the poll. So an action is like a lawsuit. It's when you go to trial. You start off with your lawsuit, which is called a statement of claim. Then the witnesses take the stand to present their evidence to the judge at the trial. It's, it's a little bit more time consuming um, sometimes it takes years to get to trial. I have matters where it's taken four or five years to actually go to trial. And the reason why the people have to testify before the judge is because there are disputed facts and the judge has to listen to everybody's story and pretty much decide who the judge believes. The, another thing you can do to get judgment is called an application. So an application starts off with a notice of application. It looks like a lawsuit. It looks like a statement of claim. The only difference between the notice of application and the actual lawsuit called the statement of claim is because is that you get a date to argue the application right away, usually in three weeks to a month. No one testifies with an application. Instead, the judge reviews evidence by 
seeing or reading people's affidavits and they attach exhibits, which is their evidence. They may have been cross-examined before, but ju the judge doesn't hear from anyone except the lawyers at court. An application is quicker and more cost-effective and the parties agree on most important facts. So that's why there is no need to testify. The difference between, another difference between the action and application is that if you sue somebody in an action and that person does not defend, the court rules say that that person is deemed or is understood to accept what you say in your statement of claim. The same thing does not happen for an application. If you start a notice of application, the person doesn't defend, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person means that or is interpreted to mean that that person accepts your story. So going to the poll. Now, in this situation, you are going to pretend that you are the judge. And in this situation, ABC Corporation failed to repay a loan given by the bank. The, bon the, loans the bank started an application against ABC Corp and its owner, John Doe. John Doe did not show up to court. Will you, as a judge, hold John Doe personally responsible for the loan? So we're looking at John Doe. We already know ABC Corp is responsible. Will John Doe be held responsible? So I'll pull up the poll and I'll ask you to vote. So yes, you hold John Doe personally liable. No, you only award judgment against ABC Corp. It depends or unsure. Really, if you're the judge, it's yes or no. And perhaps if you're unsure. So could you please vote? And I'll give you about five more seconds. And I will end the poll now. And so the majority of you said, no, you would only award judgment against ABC Corp. And second place is yes, you would hold John Doe personally liable. So I will share with you the correct answer. And on the next slide, that you, majority of you got that answer correct. In law, a corporation is a separate legal person and entity that can shield others from personal liability. So to hold someone personal res personally responsible, you must demonstrate that they were in a place of control and expressly directed a wrongful thing to be done like fraud. But in a straightforward situation where a bank loan is not paid, if you start an application against the person, unless that person signed the contract as a per and personally guaranteed it, then it's very unlikely that the court would say the person is responsible, even if they don't show up to court or they don't even defend themselves. So solutions going forward. What you may want to consider if you are going to sue somebody and that person is not likely to respond is to start a lawsuit, an action. Because if you start a lawsuit, an action, then and that person doesn't defend, they are deemed or interpreted to have agreed to what you said in your statement of claim. Now, there's no guarantee. Judges can use their discretion and say, I'm not going to give you judgment anyways, but you have a higher probability of a judge giving you judgment against the person. We were retained to re represent a client with an application against a corporation. The exact same thing happened, and the, and the client did not receive judgment in that application. We appealed, and the judge at the appeal court said, you know what, Ms. Walker, if your client wants to have this person personally responsible, the, per, the client should have started an action or have that person sign a personal guarantee. So that leads to my second point, which is get a personal guarantee if you decide to lend money to a corporation. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean the personal guarantee is signed by the person who owns the company. It really should be with someone that has assets because all the court does in a situation like this, is that say says whether you won or lost, it is up to you to collect. It's up to you to collect, get the money. And so if you sue somebody and they per provide a personal guarantee, but they have no assets, then you're probably out of luck in terms of getting a check written to you. So you would want to have a personal guarantee of someone, a grandmother, an aunt, and sister, someone who has assets, and then have that person who signs that personal guarantee get a certificate from another lawyer saying that I received independent legal advice, I understand the consequences, I understood what I am signing. So there's a, quite, there's 
to answer any questions before we move on to the next topic, KQY and SH asked, how do you prepare for litigation? And so we had this situation happen a few months ago with an employee where this employee thought that he would be terminated from the corporation. And so what I suggested is start gathering the documents because you don't want to get to a point where it's he said, she said, and the judge is trying to weigh whose story is correct or which story is more believable. You want to gather as much documents as possible, emails, text messages, anything, any documentation, because chances are, if you are dismissed, it'll be very difficult for you to go back into the corporation and collect your emails. So gather as much documentation as you can. Now, I see that there are other questions that have um, been asked. One is from MM. Is it mandatory to give legal notice in case of an application? No, it's not mandatory, but judges like to see that you have tried to work things out before going to court. Court was your last resort. So many times clients say to me, Tanya Jasu, and I say, well, you know, we need to look like we're cooperating and we didn't just jump into court. So even if you don't think the person's going to respond to the letter, send it anyway. And, in, and that gives us time to prepare your application or your lawsuit. So if there are any other questions, uh, we'll move on to the next topic. And I believe it's Rishi who will speak about location of contract. Thanks, Rishi. Thank you, Tanya. So the issue that I'll be speaking to you, as Tanya mentioned, is the location of the contract. And this deals with a similar topic to what Tanya was speaking about. Specifically, it's when you want to enforce a judgment against someone. Now, as Tanya mentioned, if you obtain a judgment, it's only a piece of paper. It's up to you to find the assets to enforce that judgment against. This creates an interesting scenario that we at Walker Law have dealt with, where an individual who you want to obtain judgment against doesn't have assets in the jurisdiction where you created a contract in or where you want to sue in, but they do have assets in another jurisdiction, for example, another province or another country. So with that being said, we'll go to the first poll. And instead of you being the judge in this scenario, we want you to be the lawyer. And you are a lawyer in Ontario. Your client in Quebec purchased a business in Quebec. After signing and purchasing the business, your client realizes that the accounting records were false and they want to sue in Ontario because that's where the seller's assets are. Would you, as a lawyer, recommend that your client starts a lawsuit in Ontario? Or would you not recommend that they start a lawsuit in Ontario and they sue in Quebec? It depends, or you're unsure. And if you are unsure, please let me know in the Q&A and I can try to clarify the question or the answers. I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer the poll. All right, we'll take a look at the poll results. So the majority of you said, no, you should sue in Quebec. Tanya, could you move to the next slide, please? And we'll see if everyone got the correct answer. And the majority of you did. The, the answer is no, you should sue in Quebec. And the reason for this is that you you're supposed to sue where the wrong happened. Generally, and I should add a caveat to this. If the purchaser wanted to sue in Ontario, there's nothing that would stop them. But if the seller challenged a lawsuit being brought in Ontario, a judge in Ontario could dismiss the lawsuit for being brought in the wrong jurisdiction. The reason for this is that when you want to bring a lawsuit, you have to start it in a jurisdiction where it's a real and substantial connection to that jurisdiction. So there's no clean definition of what a real and substantial connection is. It generally depends on the facts. So in our scenario where you're purchasing a business, a real substantial connection would be such things as where are the accountants, where are the employees, and where are the witnesses. Based on our scenario, the majority of that would be in Quebec. But that creates a problem for our client, the purchaser, because if they sue in Quebec and the seller doesn't have any assets in Quebec, once they obtain a judgment, they can't do anything with it. So what should they practically do? And there's a lengthy and complicated process where you can, apply, where you, where you can obtain a judgment in Quebec and then come to Ontario and apply to have it enforced and recognized. Now, this process involves bringing an application, which Tanya explained earlier, to a judge in Ontario. In that application, you would explain to a judge why you have to enforce the judgment in Ontario and why an Ontario court should recognize and enforce that judgment. Generally, they will look at such things as whether the judgment is fair, whether Quebec had jurisdiction to hear the, uh, the lawsuit in the first place, and whether the outcome is fair. 
Now, generally, when it comes to Quebec, this isn't a difficult issue and it's not a large hurdle to overcome because even though Quebec and Ontario have very different legal systems, Ontario courts generally accept that courts in Quebec are able to give a fair judgment. I also want to provide a brief explanation about Quebec versus non-Quebec. So as many of you may know, provinces and territories in Canada practice common law, including Ontario but Quebec practices civil law. So for Quebec, you would have to bring an application to enforce a judgment that you obtained in Quebec, but for all other provinces and territories, all you have to do is ask a court to enforce your judgment. The reason for this is that all provinces and territories except for Quebec have an agreement with Ontario in place that allows for the reciprocal enforcement of judgments. Next slide, please, Tanya. So what can business owners do to avoid the lengthy process of obtaining a judgment in Quebec and then bringing an additional application in Ontario to recognize and enforce that judgment? What you can do is include a sample choice of forum phrase, and that's something that we've included on the slide for you. Now, choice of forum is, as it, the name suggests, is a phrase in a contract that determines where any disputes will be held. So the pertinent part of this phrase is highlighted in red and underlined for your convenience. And it states, any such proceeding shall be instituted only and pursuant to the laws of Ontario, Canada. Courts are very happy to enforce these types of phrases as long as both parties knew about it and there was fair bargaining power. So if you are contracting with somebody and they have assets in another province, you can just include this phrase to make sure that any disputes are heard in the province where those assets are. Next slide, please, Tanya. So we, we did receive some questions before the webinar from AJ and HS. And our questions are, what are common mistakes made by inexperienced owners and what are general business risks? So for inexperienced business owners, a common mistake that we see is making oral contracts. Now, generally when people start a business venture, they, make, they begin that venture with their friends or their family members. And as a result, they, don't, they believe it's not necessary to reduce their agreement to writing. However, whenever you start any type of business or venture, make sure you put your agreement in writing. While it's possible to prove an oral contract and Walker Law has done so in the past, it is very difficult to prove the terms and exact details of any such oral agreement. So make sure you put your agreements in writing. As the bit, a common business risk that we see for many small and early businesses is that they don't take the time to read their contracts. For example, a recent file that I've worked on is where a small business signed a lease and the lease agreement was about 60 pages long. And the small business owners did not know that their lease contained a personal guarantee. And Tony explained earlier what a personal guarantee is, but essentially it makes the business owners liable for the business's liabilities. And if you sign this without knowing that it's there, you create a lot of liability for yourself without knowing it. So make sure you read your contracts, make sure you understand your contracts. And if you don't, or if you have difficulty, make sure you hire the right advisors so that you understand what you're agreeing to. If there are no further questions, we'll move on to- uh, Sorry to interrupt you. There was one that, that came up when you were speaking that I'd like to answer. And the question's from MM. And MM asks, uh, could you answer the jurisdiction question in case of cross-border transactions? If, the judge, if judgment is obtained in India or some other jurisdiction. Um, would you like to answer that one, Rishi, since you were talking about the topic? Absolutely. So similar to what I said about provinces, provinces in Canada, that certain provinces and territories have an agreement with Ontario to allow for the reciprocal enforcement of judgments, Canada as a whole has very similar agreements with other countries. Now, while I don't have an exact exhaustive list of all the countries that we do have those agreements with, generally it's countries that we have a that have a robust common law system. So I can't remember off the top of my head if India does have a common law system, but certain countries that do, such as the UK and Ireland or Scotland, Canada does have agreements with that allow for the easy reciprocal enforcement of judgments. So you wouldn't have to bring an application for those jurisdictions. You would simply bring a requisition at the court counter. And I can add a, I can add one step further to that. We, we did have a matter where we were considering uh, enforcement of the judgment in India. So with India specifically, they're, they're not a reciprocating jurisdiction. So you would actually have to bring a formal court proceeding to have your 
order enforced in that jurisdiction. It wouldn't be a simple over-the-counter matter in that case. Thank you for adding that, Jordan. And I'll hand it off to you now since the next section is yours. Thank you very much, Rishi. So issue number three is force majeure in supplier contracts. So force majeure continues to be a pretty hot button topic in today's economic uh, climate. And we were actually put or, or had an interesting scenario posed to us about whether or not a force majeure could be used to help you get out of other contractual arrangements outside of the scope of where the, the transaction is broken down. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit further with the scenario. But one of the other questions we had was, can a force majeure be drafted for the benefit of one party and not the other? And so both of these questions will be dealt with in our scenario. So here's our scenario for today. We decide to portray it graphically just to make it a little bit easier to follow along. And we're asking you again to put yourself in the shoes of the judge. So we ask you, the judge, can the car manufacturer rely on the force majeure in its contract with the tire supplier to get out of the contract with the dealership? So you can see in our graphical portrayal here, the contract that we're discussing is between the tire supplier and the car manufacturer. And that's where the force majeure is being triggered because the tire manufacturer cannot meet its obligations to deliver tires to the car manufacturer. So that's where the relationship breaks down. That's where it gets triggered. The question is, can that force majeure be relied upon by the car manufacturer to help it deal with the fallout in its relationship with the dealership? In other words, can it use the force majeure with the dealership as well? as a way to get out of its contractual obligations. And that brings us to our poll. So again, the question is, can the car manufacturer rely on the force majeure in its contract with the tire supplier to get out of the contract with the dealership? And what is your decision? Yes, no, it depends, or unsure. And if unsure, please put that in the Q&A. Give it about five more seconds. Wow, so we have a very interesting split here. So we have 30% yes, 30% no, 33% it depends, and then a, a small margin of you unsure. So let's go to the answer. So the answer is actually no. The car manufacturer cannot rely on the force majeure with its tire supplier in its relationship with the dealership. And the reason why is a legal term called privity of contract, but you can basically understand it to, uh, to mean the principle of parties to a contract. So only the parties to a contract can be imposed with the obligations in the contract and the benefits that it provides. So in this case, the reason the answer is no is only the tire supplier and the car dealership are a party to the contract with the force majeure. Not or the, sorry, the tire supplier and the car manufacturer and not the dealership are a party to that contract where the force majeure is in effect. And so you can't, imp you, you can't import that force majeure into another relationship. And that brings us to our next slide. So when you're dealing with these one-sided force majeures where in this case, the tire supplier had the benefit of the force majeure. The key thing in the supply chain is to make sure those sorts of protections flow down the chain. So what should have been done here is the car dealership, knowing that it had a force majeure in its contract with the tire supplier, should have had a mirroring force majeure in its contract with the dealership. So essentially, you know, something along the lines of, if the tire supplier triggers its force majeure, then my force majeure with you, the dealership is also triggered because my supply chain is disrupted. Therefore your supply chain is disrupted and our obligations need to change accordingly. And so that's something you want to keep in mind whenever you're confronting that. We do want to point you to previous webinars. Force majeures are a, a fairly large topic. We're giving it a fairly cursory review today, but we have gone over them in quite some depth. So we encourage you to look back on our previous webinars our property law webinar from April 27th, 2020, and our property law webinar from June 24th, 2020. And all that can be found on our web, uh, website in the webinars uh, tab. 
And with that, we will go to our Q&A. So we have three questions. So the first is a question from CB. What terms to include in a contract to avoid litigation? And so the obvious one, having gone through that scenario, is a force majeure. But one other thing you may want to consider is the inclusion of a mediation clause. And basically, a mediation clause says, before the parties start filing lawsuits, before we get into a formal legal dispute, we're going to sit down with a mediator. A mediator is a neutral third party that can be hired. And generally, you can seek out a mediator who has expertise in the issues you're dealing with. So if it's a large construction contract, you can find somebody who was formerly a construction litigator. If it's somebody who's, uh, if it's an employment law issue or a union issue, some, a mediator who has experience in those fields, so on and so forth. Going to the question from ND, how can businesses enforce a breach of contract at this time? I think what this question is really getting at is a lot of the uncertainty and anxiety around are the courts operational? Can I actually move things forward? Now, there was a period at the outset of the pandemic when that was certainly not the case. For, for all intents and purposes, the courts were more or less closed unless it was an urgent matter. And so the comforting news is that the court has made a huge push to digitize their operations. And now many things can be heard virtually. We've done many virtual hearings ourselves at Walker Law. And so you don't need to be concerned. There are many ways to move your uh, matters forward, file your materials online now. So not to worry, you can enforce your, enforce your breach of contract claims at this time. And then finally, questions from MM and JL. Important cases on force majeures during the pandemic. So we have looked across Canada. There are no uh, reported cases dealing squarely with this issue. And unfortunately, it would be nice to have some case law on that point, but it's really not making it to the court. Chances are a lot of these things are settling out of court or the force majeures are so clear uh, or so clearly worded that there's no ambiguity. It's just not uh, something worth litigating. And so what we do want to point you to is that there is a concept called frustration of contract. So more or less, you can think of a force majeure as a, uh, something that's in your contract that says if a specific event happens, this is how our obligations change. Frustration of contract essentially is a force majeure at common law. So a, for, a frustration of contract event happens where something outside of the control of the parties that couldn't, that couldn't be contemplated and wasn't contemplated at the par time the parties entered into the contract has made performance of the contract virtually impossible. And so we do have one case out of Hong Kong, it's very unique, but they dealt with this during the SARS pandemic where in a landlord and tenant matter, the tenant tried to cite uh, frustration of contract to get out of their uh, contract with the landlord saying that it, the, the purpose of the contract had been defeated. But in this case, the SARS pandemic only really led to a 10 day delay period due to isolation um, and so the court found, look, this is not a consequential uh, error. The, the contract hasn't broken down. It can be performed. So we're not going to say that it's been frustrated. It's a very, very high bar to set frustration of contract. So long story short, put a force measure in. And again, please refer to the past uh, webinars for further clarification on these principles. Thanks, Jordan. There's, before we move on, I just wanted to answer one question that was in the Q&A. And AO asks, can small business owners write their own contracts now that finances are tight? And uh, small business owners can write their own contracts. Um, there's nothing stopping you from doing so. But I would suggest that you uh, invest in a, a corporate lawyer. We're a trial lawyer, so we don't really write contracts. Invest in a corporate lawyer because they can save you a lot of time, money in the end. So. Uh, they might come up with certain phrases that you may, both of you may not have thought about uh, or considered, which will save you going to court or help you settle if things don't work out in the future. So I would, I would highly recommend um, investing in a contract lawyer to help you with your contracts. All right. Subject to any further questions, we'll now turn <laughs> it back over to you, Tanya. Thanks. It sounds like submissions. So I'm going oh, to speak. Yeah, true. I didn't even think of that. I'm so, pro I'm so programmed to speak to a judge. It's really bad. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. okay. So you're don't, don't judge people. Don't judge, please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Jordan. So thank uh, you're welcome, Ao. So uh, issue number four is enforcing terms of the contract and waiver. And so I, you are going to pretend to be the judge. And before I pull up the poll, I'll just describe the scenario to you, for you. And this answers a question from M H and C R about COVID-related legal situations and the contract between the buyer and seller. This isn't a COVID actual case, but I can see it happening like right now. And so you're the judge. The purchaser who has star already started to renovate commercial property that he's about to purchase does not want to complete the transaction because the vendor has not provided a certificate as required by the contract. The seller now says, um, I want you to complete the sale and sues the purchaser for breach of contract. Can the purchaser be freed from its contractual obligations because the, the certificate was not received. So summarizing it again, as I launched the poll, purchaser wants to sue the, the sorry, the, the purchaser who's already started to do some work in the, the place now says, I don't want to complete the sale and give you the money that you're owed because you're supposed to provide a certificate and you did not. The vendor says, too bad, you should pay the money. I want my money and you are the judge you're deciding. So what is your decision? Can the purchaser be freed from this contractual obligation or does the purchaser have to pay up the money to complete the purchase of the property? Yes, the purchaser must complete. Yes, the purchaser uh, can be freed from its contractual obligations. No, the purchaser cannot. It means the purchaser must go ahead and buy or unsure, please let us know using the Q&A. So yes, the purchaser can be freed, this can walk away. No, the purchaser must complete this transaction or unsure. And I'll end it in a few seconds. And it looks like there is a tie. So half of you said yes, the purchaser can be freed from its contractual obligations, it can walk away. And half of you said, no, the purchaser cannot be free. The purchaser has to complete the sale. So, and 15% of you are unsure. And please let us know uh, using the Q&A. And for any of these poll questions that, that you're unsure on of uh, the answer, if you still have more questions after we provide the answer to you, please let us know. So I'll move on. And the correct answer is no. The purchaser, uh, my, starting renovations hurts the purchaser. And it meant that there was forgiveness of complaints, and this is known as waiver. And so, no, the purchaser is not freed from completing its contractual obligations, um, and it must complete the sale. So, waiver really, I dealt with this case, um, and the citations at the bottom, and it was, we won at trial, and it was appealed to the Court of Appeal, which is the highest level court in Ontario, and we won at the Court of Appeal. And so what happened in this situation was that we were, I represented the vendor who sold the assets. The purchaser came into the premises and started doing all these renovations and later on said, I, you know, I changed my mind, I don't wanna complete the sale, plus he didn't give me a certificate. So we went to trial on that and the judge said, if you really re were relying on that certificate to complete the sale, the transaction, you wouldn't have gone in there and started to renovate. And going in and renovating hurt that purchaser's case and it, the purchaser was responsible for paying the purchase price for the assets. So in, or, in order to rely on waiver, you have to demonstrate that the other side knows that the certificate, for example, was outstanding and an unequivocal and conscientious intention to not rely on the certificate is demonstrated by going in and starting to renovate the, the property, even though the certificate wasn't handed in. So Here's a copy of a part of the court decision that we received. And you can see at the top, we started it off actually as an application because when the client retained us, it seemed like it was pretty simple to me where someone came in, started to fix the property and then said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay the money for it. So it just looked like we needed a decision made by the judge. But, you, but while I was giving my, my submissions on February 9th, 2016, the judge actually said, you know what, Ms. Walker, I want to hear from your clients, both sides. I'm going to convert this to a trial and we'll just proceed as if your notice of application was a statement of claim and, I, and they'll have to testify because I want to hear this story. 
And so you can see we started off on February 9th and then we continued on May 26th in court. And you can see at the bottom here that it was ordered for $131,000 to be paid to my client. So moving on to the next slide, the costs were quite significant just because it was an app, started off as an application, but because the judge ordered for us to continue on as a trial, um, we had to do uh, cross-examinations and it ended up costing, well, more than $30,000, but the court usually awards 60 to 80% of your legal fees, not 100% of your legal fees. So to avoid this problem in the future, and why I believe this is a kind of a COVID case, because I can see the situation where there's an agreement to purchase assets or a purchase a business, things happen, the economic climate goes as it does, and then someone does not have the financing or changes their mind about the purchase. And so if you have, are you, if you are contemplating going into the premises or acting as if the contract is actually okay, you may want to include a term like this in your contract. And what I'm really getting at is the red font and it, where it says the purchaser expressly reserves the right to rely on any, upon any condition. So that means that there is no waiver. Uh, if the certificate's not produced, then the purchaser doesn't have to close. Had there been such a term in this contract, we might have lost at trial and in the court of appeal. And so the, a question from DM, I'll move on to the next slide, but I'll answer DM's questions uh, first is, had they not started the reno, what would have happened? Had they not started the reno, we probably would have lost at trial. I would have encouraged my client not to start a court proceeding because we did not do our part, which was provide, it was numerous certificates, but I just, for the sake of the poll, I just relied on one. But because they went in there, that's what was detrimental to their case. So looking at, I hope I, that answers your question. Looking at the question from JD, when JD registered, can a recording be evidence of a contract? Yes, it can. And this is a case that I argued at trial in 2015. This is a case that actually took about five years to get to trial and it was almost a month trial. And in this situation, uh, for the breach of contract aspect of it, my client had recorded a conversation between that client and the other side where the other side admitted to the debt and admitted that my client would be repaid. And I played that conversation to the judge. How it usually works here in Canada is one person has to consent to the recording and the person that usually consents is the person that's recording it. So a recording can be evidence of a contract. I, another, another question is from IB and I believe Jordan's going to answer this one, is what is the impact of COVID acknowledgement terms? Jordan? Thank you very much, Tanya. So COVID acknowledgement terms is another one of those trendy uh, phrases that are popping up these days, similar to force majeure. Essentially what a COVID acknowledgement term is, is a waiver in essence. So you'll see now when you go into a business premises, Sometimes you'll be asked to sign a, an acknowledgement, basically saying, I understand that in entering these premises, I may be exposed to the virus. I may be around people who have the virus. And, you know, we as a, as a company, as an entity can only do so much to protect you. Similarly, these are usually two-sided where they also ask you to affirm, I haven't been outside of the country. I am myself not displaying any symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. And so, what is interesting to note about these, although we haven't found any cases that have gone to court with respect to these terms, is that the consensus would be at law, just because a business asks you to sign one of these acknowledgements, doesn't mean that they just get off carte blanche and they can uh, you know, push their obligations to the side in terms of trying to maintain a safe space. So a really easy example would be, if you went to a restaurant, they had you sign an acknowledgement or, or verbally declare that you acknowledge certain risks and then they don't wash the plates or the cutlery between servings. Of course, that would amount to gross negligence and no amount of waivers, acknowledgements is going to excuse that sort of behavior. That's the way the law looks at those sorts of things. So the business owner operator has a part to play in this as well. It's not, uh, it's not just a carte blanche waiver. 
And with that, we will turn to issue number five, unless we have number, another question. I just saw another question come up. So assuming that the business is taking, oh, this is from AR. So assuming that the business is taking reasonable precautions, does the waiver provide some protection? Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the answer to that question is yes, right? Reasonable precautions is gonna depend on the nature of the business and, and what is required in their interactions with the public in general and their patrons. So it's gonna be a very fact specific inquiry and the, the court will look on a, on a case by case basis. So reasonable is gonna depend, you know, what reasonable is is gonna depend on what you do as a business. But assuming you are taking all reasonable steps, then the waiver would provide some protection. Uh, and, and Amanda also asks, so it's better to have than not. The answer is yes, but also keep in mind that when we deal with judges, they not only look at the contract, they also look at any uh, emails and text messages going back and forth to show what everyone kind of intended at the time that the waiver was signed. So that could be also be used as evidence unless you have something that says it cannot. Jordan? And that goes to uh, Rishi with issue number five and misrepresentations. Thank you, Jordan. Now, a lot of you suggested that you were interested in this issue, so I'll try to spend a little bit more time on it, being mindful that we do want to leave aside some time for a Q&A period at the end. So we'll begin by discussing three types of misrepresentations that courts in Ontario generally accept. The first is innocent misrepresentation. Now, these are accidents or mistakes, something that somebody says that they believe is true, but is false. Now, the consequence of making an innocent misrepresentation it allows the innocent party to end a contract. Negligent misrepresentation, on the other hand, is carelessness. It's when somebody makes a representation, but they don't take any time to consider whether or not that representation is true. If someone makes an innocent uh, negligent misrepresentation, it allows the innocent party to sue for damages. Lastly, there's fraudulent misrepresentation, and this is often seen as the worst. And this is when someone is being knowingly deceitful. When there is a fraudulent misrepresentation, the innocent party is entitled to rescind the contract, which means to cancel it, or and claim damages. Now that you know the different types of uh, consequences of misrepresentations, I do want to add a little bit of a caveat to innocent misrepresentations. So when is an innocent misrepresentation, as I stated, that allows the innocent party, so the party who relied on the innocent misrepresentation to cancel the contract. Now, as you can imagine, there are some scenarios where you can't do that. For example, if you purchased a house and you knocked the house down to rebuild it, and then you discovered an innocent misrepresentation, you can't cancel, cancel the contract because you can't put everyone back into the position they would be in if the contract was never signed. So what you can do in that scenario is if you're able to reframe the, mis the misrepresentation as a warranty, then you can also sue for damages. So an example of what that would look like is if a, the seller of a home stated that the, the roof was replaced in the last year and they really believed that, but for some reason it wasn't, that's an innocent misrepresentation. But if the seller also said that the roof was replaced last year and should last another 10, then that can be a warranty which allows you to sue for damages. Now that you understand the types of misrepresentations and what the results are in court, we'll move on to the first poll question for this section. So in this scenario, we ask you once again to be the judge. And an individual agrees to buy a bakery only if the financial targets are met. The accountant of the bakery, that, that business that was being sold, changes the numbers to meet the financial targets that the purchaser expected. But they stated that these financial targets were only possible with optimal management and restructuring. These numbers were fairly unrealistic. These Modified financial statements also stated on the top that they were for discussion only. What kind of misrepresentation was this, if any? Was it a fraudulent misrepresentation because the accountant knew the statements were deceitful? Was it negligent because the accountant knew the figure was impossible? Or was it innocent because the accountant thought the numbers were possible? Or there was no misrepresentation because it was for discussion only, or you could be unsure. And if you're unsure, let me know why in the Q&A and, and I could try to illuminate the uh, issue a little bit for you. So I'll give you another 10 seconds or so to answer the poll and we'll bring up the poll results and a uh, subsequent slide in a minute or so. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you thought it was a fraudulent misrepresentation. In second place, it was negligent and some of you thought it was innocent. And some of you also thought there was no misrepresentation or it was unsure. 
So let's move to the next slide and we'll discuss those answers. So the answer is that B, it was a negligent misrepresentation. And this was based on a case that actually went through the court system. And because the majority of you thought it was a fraudulent misrepresentation, I'll start with why it wasn't. Now, fraudulent misrepresentation, as I said, requires you to be knowingly deceitful. It requires you to make a knowingly false statement, an intention to deceive, and must have materially induced the innocent party and include a dishonest state of mind of the person making the misrepresentation. Now, the reason why this was not a fraudulent misrepresentation was because the statements weren't knowingly false. The accountant stated that they were possible. The accountant knew of scenarios where they would be possible. So it wasn't outright falsified or doctored documents. The scenario, there were possible scenarios that could have resulted in it. Now, it wasn't an innocent misrepresentation because this wasn't an honestly made mistake. The accountant intentionally knew that what they were saying didn't reflect the true state of affairs. So why was it a negligent misrepresentation? As, as I stated in the previous example, the modified financial statements were possible. It required optimal restructuring of the business and a different management structure. The reason why this was a negligent misrepresentation is because the accountant should have known that, the, that this scenario was not possible. For this reason, the accountant's representations were careless. I also want to illuminate the issue a little bit of uh, what's required for a, neg a negligent misrepresentation. It requires a duty of care, an untrue representation that was made negligently. The recipient must have relied on the misrepresentation to their detriment. Now, what a duty of care means, for those of you who haven't heard the term before, it's when somebody owes someone else a reasonable standard of care. So when you rely on someone's statements, for example, the purchasers of the business in the scenario, they relied on the accountant's statements. That's only reasonable in certain scenarios. So it's reasonable to rely on an accountant's statements when it comes to accounting records. So for that, because that's reasonable, the accountant would owe a duty of care. And the accountant failed to live up to that duty of care because they were careless in the way that they framed those financial statements. So we'll move on to the next section where we'll discuss how you can protect yourself from the seller, if you're the seller or the purchaser, from being accused of or being a victim of a misrepresentation. So in our previous scenario, if you were the purchaser, you should let the seller know what information you are relying on. So in our previous example, if you were the purchaser, you'd want to say very explicitly that I am assuming that these accounting statements are made based on current information or reflect the current statement of affairs for the business. If you were the seller, you'd also want to let the purchaser know what assumptions you're relying on whenever you make a statement. For example, you might want to say, I'm providing these financial projections based on my assumption that you are able to operate a bakery or, you're a, or you have experience with managing a bakery's expenses. When you state your assumptions, it's very difficult for someone else to say that they were misled by a slightly incorrect statement. Now, unless there are any questions, we'll move, questions about misrepresentations, we'll move on to our Q&A period and Tanya will help address some of the questions that some of you guys have asked. Before I get to the questions, Rishi, there is one question that was asked by DK and I'll read it out loud for you. Um, perhaps you can answer it since it's, you were just talking about this uh, topic. Prior to a condominium corporation annual general meeting, candidates running for the board of directors are required to complete a disclosure form which then goes out to all owners in the AGM package. If a candidate claims in this form to occupy a unit in the building, but it's demonstrated that that candidate lives off site, would this be considered fraudulent? And do you think this would disqualify the candidate from running or the results of the election if voting owners relied on this information disclosure form? What do you think? Fraudulent, negligent, what are the consequences? I think it depends on the exact scenario. So if they, is it possible that the individual lived in two sites? Now, I, I think for the purposes of your question, we're assuming that they were dishonest. And if you are intentionally dishonest, I think that that would be very similar to lying on a, jo a job application. So if you were intentionally dishonest and you made a dishonest statement in order to obtain a benefit, then it's probably a fraudulent misrepresentation. Now, the second part of your question was, would that disqualify that candidate from the uh, AGM process? Now, that would depend on the exact rules of the condo corporation and the requirements to be on their board. Is it possible that they're willing to waive such requirement? That would depend on exact factors relating to that condo. 
Thank you, Rishi. So I'll move on and please, we have about five more minutes left. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to type them in. These are some questions from those of you who registered. One is from MA. What are the latest developments in EPC contracts? And EPC contracts are engineering procurement and construction contracts. It is a form of a building contract used for large complex projects. So you can think of it as a project. It, pro it projects finance documents that allocate the risk of the project between the owner and the contractor. So we anticipate seeing a rise in the use of material adverse change terms that allow a party to walk away from a transaction where a substantial change occurs between signing and closing. Um, adverse change might be a pandemic or a potential event, a third wave, we're not too sure, but that's something that we anticipate. Uh, the question from BS is, what is the future of real estate brokerages after the pandemic? It's hard for me to say as a trial lawyer, uh, but what I think in terms of just being a business owner is that there, my thoughts that is that there will be a need because perhaps even a greater need if people continue to work from home. They're, they may want to ensure now their home has suitable office space and that may cause them to want to, to move to accommodate that size. A question from SF is residential service contracts between the service provider, such as an HVAC contractor and homeowner regarding deposits and pay for completed work. I don't think that there's any change at all regarding those type of contracts. Uh, you would have, to, if the work is completed, you should have to pay um, and, unless there's some reason not to pay. So uh, I'll bring everyone back, Rishi and Jordan. I'm not sure if anyone else has any further questions. But if not, I'd like to thank everyone, including Rishi and Jordan, for, and especially Marley, who's, who is watching this, um, for your hard work. Um, it was a, it's been a very uh, different year, and um, I really appreciate everything everyone has done. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your day to participate in our presentation. Oh, I see there's a question. And yes, you're welcome, AR. And so, um, and if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to one of us. Thank you all, and I hope you stay safe and healthy. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye.